Welcome to Family Discovery Day. This is so much fun to be able to be here at Discovery Day, and we'd love to have you join us. Discovery Day is amazing because there's something for everyone here. We have activities for children, we have activities for youth, we have activities for adults. We have multiple different classes. We have all the different things here to help you learn how to find your family history, to do your own personal family history, just give you the tools, the resources, the knowledge to be successful at whatever family history you are interested in. This big event is held down here at the YSA, Spanish Fork YSA Stake Center. It has two chapels, great big cultural hall. There's room for everybody and everything, and it would be just wonderful to have you join us. Our keynote speaker here today is Todd Hansen from Story Trek, and he's gonna to talk to us about the importance of the story. He's awesome, enjoy his wonderful keynote. Well, good morning. It's great to be here in Spanish FARC. <laughs> I spent many, many a Saturday and Sunday mornings in Spanish FARC growing up. This is where my grandma, or my grandma lived. My mother grew up here. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So I feel like I'm among friends, maybe among some family here in Spanish FARC. As that's the way my dad always said it. He grew up in Santa Quinn, so, you know, <laughs> cut him some slack, right? So I am here to speak to you today, I think, probably because of Roots Tech years ago. I was asked to give a keynote speech at Roots Tech, and, you know, I got that phone call. And they said, hey, we're, we're from Roots Tech, and we'd, we'd love to have you do a keynote speech for us. And, like, hey, yeah, that sounds fun, it'll be great. Um, what's Roots Tech? <laughs> I had no idea. So they explained what Roots Tech was. If, if any of you in this audience can imagine, I had no idea what Roots Tech was. And uh, they explained it and I said, well, is it okay that I don't know anything about genealogy or family history? And they said, yeah, that's, that's fine. We want you to talk about story. And I said, well, I know a little bit about stories and storytelling. And you know, this was before they got lightweights like Donny Osmond and Laura Bush <laughs> to speak at Roots Tech. You know, they got big shots like me <laughs> to speak at Roots Tech. So I do a show, and it's, uh, it's called The Story Trek. And let's see if this is working. Yeah, it's working. It's great. It's always a bonus when technology works. I never plan on it. It's called the Story Trek, and the operative word in this show is story. And I can find a story anytime, anywhere, out of anyone. That's always been the way I've approached this show. Hey, don't leave. You have to be on our show. You want to tell your story? Right now, right here? Yeah. In the golf cart? In the golf cart. It's all about the golf cart. Are we going golfing? We could. You bring your sticks? No. Oh, you probably have some extras. I actually do. I'll, I'll yeah. share. Do you live here in Vantage? I do. What's your name? I'm Brian. Brian, I'm Todd. Hey, Todd. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, uh... You want to jump on? Yes, let's go. All right. Let's leave the crew in the dust. Let's Come see on. if they can keep up. No, don't forget about them. Let's oh. go. All right, guys. We need a little breeze. I'm right hot. Here. Come on. It's about some personal time. Yep, we need this. Uh, it doesn't matter. All right, it's just random. Okay. Brian, I have no idea where you're taking me. You thirsty? I wasn't sure what would happen next. The crew didn't know what was going on. I was just pleased someone finally gave me the time of day. All right. And there we go. Some kind of a story, I don't know what. <laughs> You've never heard from again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're doing a story with you whether you want to or not. There you go. Well, it's probably going to be the highlight of your trip. And it was a highlight. That was Brian Stockdale from Vantage, Washington. Had a great story, and that's the way I find my stories. You know, as a reporter at a TV station, I fought and kicked and scratched and researched and tried to find great stories. And I never got as great of stories as when I just went and randomly knocked on doors or found a guy in a golf cart. Just ordinary, everyday people have incredible stories. Without a great story, you don't have a great TV show, but there are great stories everywhere. Just look around you. Look in front of you, look behind you, look 
to each side of you. Everyone has a great story. If you have drawn breath on this planet, you have a story to tell. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what you look like. I don't care if you don't think you have a story. I will prove you wrong. Hi there, how are you? Shocking, TV cameras are at the door. I don't want TV cameras. <laughs> the best response I've heard in a long time. I'm just an ordinary person. I don't have a great story. Well, we love ordinary people. We think everybody's got a great story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, don't run away. <laughs> it's, it's your chance at fame. <laughs> you guys want to be on TV? What's that? Not exactly. <laughs> it depends on what we're talking so about, story, right? Yeah. What's the story? That's a good question. Hi there. Good. How are you? Fine. Good. So, surprise, we got television cameras. Okay. We're with a TV show called The Story Trek. Mm -hmm. No, we don't have an interesting story. Really? No, no, that's what but... everybody tells me. <laughs> I'll bet you've got a very interesting story. Really? <laughs> yeah. On the way to the next door, I noticed producer Troy chatting up some ladies. Boom. Hey. Sorry. I ain't got no story. Everybody's yes, got a story. Got a no, story. No, 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 Everybody's got a story. No. You want to tell your story? Who wants to tell their story? Hi there. How are you? Not too bad. Sometimes when I knock on doors, this happens really camera shy, so. Oh, really? Yeah. And no matter how many times they tell me, they won't tell me. So if you're interested, I'd love to, love to get to know you. Uh, no, I don't think so. You think you're gonna pass? Yeah. They still can't help but to tell me their story. One of those stories. Really? They've already started talking. Yeah, so what, what's your name? Eric. Yes. Eric, nice to meet you, Eric. Oh, the tag dog's coming. How are you? I'm good. Or not. I think I'm okay. Really? I'm you're, you're gonna pass on this? I don't have anything interesting to say. And she's so right. Until she started saying stuff. So where are you from? <laughs> and to a person, they all had a great story. The stories that fate sends me are amazing. So what is the big deal about this word, story? It's an interesting word. A story is an account of incidents or events. A statement regarding the facts pertinent to a situation in question. Sounds like I'm reading you your rights. But isn't that what you do with family history? You're finding those facts, you're finding those dates, those names, those places. Piecing all of that together into a story doesn't the story of our ancestors help tell us who we are? So there's a quote by Daniel Taylor, who has written books about that word, story. To be a person is to have a story to tell. We are the product of all the stories that we've ever heard, all the stories that we have ever told, or even the product of stories that we haven't heard that other people have heard, then their stories have influenced our story. It's kind of deep if you think about it. So why is it that so many people don't think much of their lives, that they don't think they have a story? Well, it's because we're just ordinary people. We're just living our lives and we're not thinking about our lives. We're not reflecting on our lives, we get caught up in the day-to-day -day of life. We get up, we shower, we dress, we drive to work, we eat dinner, we rinse, we repeat. That's life. And unless somebody knocks on our door, a goofy guy with a camera crew, and we're forced to reflect on that life, and we're forced to think about what we've been through, what we've accomplished, what we're looking forward to, what we're hoping to overcome, what has meaning, what the plot of our lives is, we continue to think that our lives don't mean much. 
But I prove story after story, episode after episode, that everyone has a compelling story, which means you have a compelling life. I uh, write these compelling stories for television. I put them on the air. And one time I was talking about how, you know, it takes me a long time to craft these stories when I sit down and I write them. And the guy I was talking to said, well, wait a minute. You don't, you don't write for your TV show. You sit down and talk to people. And you, and you just have cameras recorded. You just have a conversation. Ain't no writing on your TV show. And I love that it seems so effortless. <laughs> but it's really not that effortless to put together a TV show. So to prove that, maybe we can do an experiment. And to do that experiment, I, I need a volunteer who can come up here and help me. Do I have any volunteers? We had a quick hand right here. Can you come up, young man? So the story track, and you all know the experience with the story track. So have you seen the show before? Yes. OK. So thank you. He says he loves the show. And uh, the challenge with the story track is I, as I delve into the deep, dark secrets, you know, I make you cry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that may not happen here this morning. So uh, what's your name? Mason Miller. OK, Terrence. Ma uh, yeah. OK, Terrence, it's, uh, it's, good to, it's good to meet you. Terrence. I really thought I heard Terrence, but I can't be sure. It doesn't matter. This guy looks shifty. But just wait until you hear his story. OK. Terrence, so uh, what, did you, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Uh, granola bar. Wow. Uh, a I had to get up early. A granola bar. Hmm. That sounds, that sounds emotional. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds sad. I mean, of all the breakfasts that you could have, I mean, you could have had a nice warm breakfast, maybe an omelet, you know, maybe some bacon, some eggs, a waffle, oatmeal, just anything, you know. Terrence, I like to, I like to think back to those halcyon days when, when I was a teenage boy like you, and for breakfast I could eat like buckets of cereal, or maybe dozens of granola bars, I wouldn't gain an ounce of weight. Well, those days are gone by, you know, Terrence. It doesn't happen anymore. But you know what? We can't dwell in the past. We need to think about today. And today, wow, today is a good day. Because we're at this conference, and there's so many great classes going on. So many people in this audience. I mean, this turnout is incredible. I heard that maybe Donny Osmond is going to be here later. This is so cool. We're having so much fun here today. I mean, isn't this amazing? All right. That sort of stuff doesn't happen during a conversation normally, does it? You know? No. Like the, the, the music at the right moment doesn't just magically appear from heaven. The narrated voice saying, well, Terrence seems like a shifty guy, but wait until you hear his story. That does, just doesn't magically appear, right, during a conversation. The, the perfect reversal shot of me nodding in approval doesn't just happen on the TV screen. The pictures from our youth don't just appear. That's all edited in and everything. Mason, thank you so much. You, thank you've, you. Been a, you've been a good victim today. Yay. Appreciate it. So uh, that's what we do in TV. We, we put music in, and, and we let you know how you're supposed to feel during certain parts of the story. I write in my narrated voice, and then I voice that in a voice booth, and we edit in those reversal shots, and we get the pictures from the youth, and we, and we do all those things that we're 
supposed to do, you know, to, to make it great for television. And they turn out to be amazing, incredible stories from ordinary, boring people like me. And I know what you're saying. Maybe not that I'm boring, but that if I were to knock on your door, that you would be boring and not have anything to say. But guess what? I am completely boring. I'm a really boring, dorky guy. And I have the pictures to prove it. <laughs> this is me as a kid, dorky kid growing up in Pleasant Grove, Utah. Didn't know much, I was very shy, and it just got worse <laughs> as I got older. Junior high. I think my sister did my hair that day <laughs> for picture day. That's my Farrah Fawcett hair. <laughs> Feathered, parted in the front. You know, I didn't have a great pedigree. There were no lawyers, doctors, senators in my family. Dad worked out at a steel mill, Geneva. You know, he was a mechanic. This was the small house we lived in, in Pleasant Grove. Three bedrooms, uh, no basement, five kids. I remember when my parents converted the garage into a family room, so where that garbage can is, I pulled that off Google Maps, that's the way it looks today. Um, we didn't have a boat. <laughs> looks like they have two boats, wow. And uh, yeah, they converted that into a living space that actually turned into their bedroom later. It was tiny, but I was tiny back then, so it seemed big. I remember the bully across the street stealing my BB gun, shooting me with it as I ran away. I remember the bully down the street terrorizing me, beating me up. Um, I remember being completely awesome one day, jumping off this 50-foot ramp on my new bike. Okay, I, I said I was small then, so everything seemed big. It wasn't a 50-foot ramp. At some point while living there, before we moved when I was 10 years old, I became incredibly terrified of people. I was terribly shy for many years. My mother was horribly worried about me. What would become of me someday? Maybe it was the bullies, I don't know. But it's all part of my story. The incredible thing about a story is the power therein. And when you take the time to record your story, you then have the power to change your story. It's only when we think about our lives that we think about how we can change our lives. And I'm not saying rewrite history. I'm saying make your future happen. Whatever story you are living right now, whatever heartache you are dealing with, whatever challenge seems unbearable, whatever the class, whatever the physical challenge, the mental challenge, whatever the whatever, just know that the story you're living right now isn't your story. It's only a chapter. And if you want a better story, it can happen tomorrow. And if life is going great, you can't imagine how it could get any better, it can change tomorrow. So you need to be ready for it. The future isn't written, no matter what you think is destined for your life. Guaranteed life probably has a different plan for you. And my plan growing up, it was, uh, it was pretty simple. You know, I didn't want to work out at Geneva like my dad. Um, I wasn't going to be a big shot college boy like those smarty pants, you know. I was going to do something amazing with my life in one very particular way. And that was uh, on the gridiron for the greatest team ever. And that, uh, that you know. It's here for the Cowboys. <laughs> Got a thumbs down over here. 
You either love them or you hate them. They're America's team. And you, and you either hate that statement or you love that statement. I, I went to my very first NFL football game this year, and it was a playoff game in Dallas, Texas, where the Cowboys played the Seattle Seahawks. And, and the Cowboys getting into the playoffs has been a very rare thing lately. And the Cowboys winning a playoff game has been a very rare thing. And so for me to, I mean, my first NFL football game in Dallas, Texas, my Cowboys. Since a kid, I've worshiped these guys. And they win. I'm there. It was a spiritual experience. <laughs> it was amazing. <sighs> There's nothing I would have rather done than played football for the Cowboys. I loved football. And I'll tell you what, I was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, the glory days, number 36, I was a beast. I was pretty fast, I had pretty good hands, good balance, opponents had a hard time tackling me. <sighs> Ninth grade, right there. <laughs> People thought, you know, when this guy, this beast is a senior, he is going to be absolutely unstoppable. Well, told you life had different plans, right? That day, I think that very day when that picture was taken, I stopped growing. <laughs> so I'm the same height as that day. Well, it's okay, you can be undersized in the NFL, and uh, you just have to work harder, be smarter. Eh, I wasn't smarter, didn't work harder. And then uh, I had three knee surgeries in high school. So my junior year, I was playing a football game against Payson. Uh, Payson. <laughs> Took a handoff up the middle, immediately got hit, planted my left leg. Opponent dove at me, hit my leg, bent my knee in a way that it's not supposed to bend, and got carried off the field, had major surgery. They put a pin in, sewed up some ligaments. A few days later, and the doctor said, young man, you will never play football again. But amazing thing is I was a teenager and I knew a lot more than doctors at that point in my life. So I went out to the first practice of summer football my senior year and a miracle happened. I blew out my knee. <laughs> never played football again and I was devastated. But I had Another goal, one other thing in my life that I desperately wanted to do. Ever since I knew what a missionary was for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I wanted to be one. I couldn't explain why, I just wanted to be one. Well, it's one thing to want to do something. It's another thing to actually do it. Because I don't know what the expectations are in 2019. But when I went on a mission, they actually wanted you to talk to people. <laughs> and that was my biggest fear, talking to creepy adults. <laughs> if you look around the room, you'll understand why I was afraid. <laughs> I look in the mirror now, I get it. <laughs> but it was my deepest desire. So despite my fears, I went. So there I am, MTC I loved, you know. But then get out there. First day of knocking on doors, it's a terribly hot day in June. Knocking on doors on Sunset Boulevard of all places, if you can imagine this. It's not what you think. Sunset Boulevard, Greenwood, Indiana. <laughs> Took a picture. Sunset Boulevard, Lawndale Drive. 
wanted a picture of the first place I knocked on doors. And I was absolutely terrified, but after a little while, I thought, hey, this isn't so bad. My senior companion is knocking on all the doors. He's doing all the door approaches. So I'm like, hey, okay, this is, this is good. He's doing it all. No problem. And this is my senior companion um, and me. That's me on the left. That's me and him on the right. And I should explain that picture on the right. A few mission presidents before my mission president uh, decided he didn't like the term tracting. Thought that was a weird term, go knocking on doors and handing out pamphlets. So he wanted to change it to, when you're going out doing that, we call it field teaching. <laughs> so we thought it'd be funny to take a picture of us field teaching. <laughs> Indiana's famous for cornfields. So there we are teaching the first discussion to a cornfield. Anyway, we're out there uh, first day knocking on doors on Sunset Boulevard, and I'm terrified he's knocking on all the doors, but then the dreaded words, the next door is yours, Elder. And I was so scared. Um, I thought, what can I do? I fake a knee injury, run away, faint, didn't have cell phones, couldn't book a flight home. <laughs> Started walking slower, tried to get out of it. And he said, you know, you just, you need to do it. You're not gonna get out of it. And it will get easier. I was honestly really worried about the public relations nightmare for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints when the headlines read, Dateline, Greenwood, Indiana, Mormon missionary drops dead on porch. Because <laughs> I knew that's what would happen. But he prodded me, I went up to that door, and a miracle happened. I have no memory of what happened. <laughs> Which is a miracle, because I didn't die. I don't know if they laughed at me, yelled at me, slammed the door in my face. I don't think I cried. And he was right, it got easier, and it got easier quickly. And I became a leader in the mission, and I started making these amazing connections with people, and I realized they don't know who I am, and I got over my shyness, and I became the person I always knew I could be, and I realized that uh, maybe I was given a weakness so that it could become a strength later. I'm going to skip that video. Mark Twain said there was never yet an uninteresting life. Such a thing is an impossibility. Inside the dullest exterior, there is a drama, a comedy, and a tragedy. So please believe that you have a story. All of that was a part of my story, my missionary experience, my football experience. It made me into who I am today. And everyone who went before us makes your story much more interesting. It makes you who you are. Even if you've never heard their story, they got you to where you are. Because we're all connected as well. Somehow we all ended up here today in this room. I ended up here today thanks to the stories of many others. John Wesley Norton, my great, 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 great grandfather, was asked by Brigham Young to be in the very first group of pioneers with him to enter the Salt Lake Valley. He then went back and brought his family. Isaac Morley was one of the first members of the church. He made the pioneer trek to Utah in 1848. Albert Smith was driven out of Nauvoo, Illinois, started the trek west. He joined the Mormon battalion, went to California, then met his family in Utah. Jens Peter Hansen sailed from Denmark after he was baptized into the church, became a missionary in Denmark, then trekked to Utah in 1858. Then, Maybe some of you Spanish FARC people have heard of Erickson's. Uh, Eolfer Erickson 
brought his three children to America in 1879. His wife was too sick to travel, so she stayed behind in Iceland. And one of his children died in Council Bluffs, Iowa. He settled in Spanish Fork, where his wife later came. Then she later died. He married Jarthruder Runolf's daughter. I have some of their stories. I wish I knew more. It's terribly important that you record your stories. Don't wait for me to knock on your door. <laughs> it's statistically impossible that I will knock on your door. I've done the math, and if people stopped being born like five years ago in the United States, just the United States, it would have taken me, at the rate I tell stories on my show, four million years <laughs> to get to all the stories. So I'm just, it's not going to happen. I will not knock on your door. So you have to tell your own stories. And these days it's, it's so easy to be able to tell your own story. There are so many ways you can do it. Back then, it was a pencil and a piece of paper. And you can still use that method. I prefer a pen. But you can even just talk into your phone. You can, if you have a cassette recorder still, talk into that. I have cassettes of my grandpa, which are priceless these days. Um, so many ways. But people ask me all the time, what's the best way to categorize it, chronicle it? And I've never really had a good answer. And so over the last year, it's taken a full year, I've worked on an app. You always say there's an app for that. Well, finally, there's an app for that, and I call it Capture. So I've created an app, and Capture, C-A-P-C-H-U-R. I was never good with that spelling stuff. <laughs> never won a spelling bee. It's just a clever way to spell Capture. So you can go to capture.me. It's free to download, free to use. You're not going to be charged money to use this app. And it's a way to capture your story. So you can download it on the Google Play Store. You can download it on the iPhone App Store. Just search for Capture, C-A-P-C-H-U-R. And it just it captures your life story. And, and we thought, you know, you always have a phone with you. Most people have a phone with you. And it's a way to just capture life's meaningful moments at all times. And it chronicles it. it with a calendar, with a map. You can export those meaningful moments to PDF. And we hope it turns out to be a cool thing. Who knows? And if you followed me on social media, you know that we just released this app. The way I approach the story trick is with the idea that everyone I meet is a child of God. I'm not sure that every other re reality TV show host does that. But that's the way I approach the show. I hope that after watching the show, people see people differently. I hope that they'll understand before they judge somebody by the way they look or act or dress or what they say, they'll understand that maybe, maybe you should get to know that person, get to know what's going on in their life. And understand that every person you come in contact with every single day, every person you see, every person you even catch a glimpse of every day is important, is special, has a compelling story, and is worth getting to know. And more important than that, the person that you see in that mirror every day looking back at you is important, is special, has a compelling story, and you are worth getting to know. God loves you because that's it. He just loves you.
unconditionally, no matter what. He wants you to make great choices, but even when you don't, God just loves you. So know, always know that you are worth loving unconditionally. And if you're worth that, well, for heaven's sakes, you probably have a pretty great story. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.